Hey Sopranos fans, welcome to another Machiavellian Monday here on Sopranos Street, soon to be renamed Bully Whispers, same channel, just a different name, and we are here today to evaluate the answer to the question of how Machiavellian was Polly Walnuts. Between his backdoor dealings with Johnny Sack in New York and his strangling to death of an old lady to steal her money, Polly would seem to fit the conniving, cutthroat stereotype commonly associated with Machiavellianism, but it's actually much more specific than that. For viewers new to the series, The Prince was essentially a how-to-rule manual for current or aspiring leaders, detailing the most effective ways of dealing with specific situations and different types of people based on Machiavelli's historical observations. So, how Machiavellian was Polly Walnuts? In answering this question, we will take a look at his personality in general, as well as some of his quirks and the impact they could have on his perception, before moving on to how they could affect his leadership potential from a Machiavellian standpoint. Along the way, we will see how he acted more like the people than the prince on occasion, how he was probably underutilized by Tony, and lastly, how in his famous attempt to parallel Machiavelli and Sun Tzu, Sun Tzu, the Chinese prince Machiavelli, Tony Tony Tony. <laughs> the quote he referenced was one of the worst he could have chosen. In evaluating his personality in general, we must first take a look at his level of boldness. For Machiavelli said that, with a few exceptions, good fortune is like a woman, a lover of men with the audacity to command her, and Polly was certainly bold. But just like in many other areas in which he may be considered Machiavellian, he tends to push the envelope, although not to quite the same degree as, say, Richie Aprile or Ralph Cifaretto. Instead, he would fall more along the lines of someone like Syl when he's gambling. I love fucking cheese at my feet. I stick motherfucking provolone in my socks at night so they smell like your sister's crotch in the morning. All right? Machiavelli also states that, essentially, a prince should be stingy with his own money, which we definitely see, but generous with other people's money, which is seen in perfect context and, as usual, pushed to the limits when Polly racks up a huge tab for Christopher to pay. In context, Christopher was supposed to pay the tab, so Polly wasn't exactly being a violator of Chris's property, which is one of the worst things a prince can be viewed as. He just pushed the limits. The other worst thing a prince can be viewed as is a violator of his people's women, and while he isn't that, especially compared to some other people, he pushes the envelope here as well. Buffalo mozzarella. Machiavelli also states that a prince should be slow to believe, slow to act, and proceed in a temperate manner, which may seem completely unlike Polly. But he did demonstrate the ability to be slow to believe with both Chris. Way I see it, Tony. He must have known the gun was empty. Look what he pumped into your car. And Vito. I don't know. Fucking slander ass me. Tell you one thing. If it was me this kid was spreading rumors about, he'd have something up his own ass. And it wouldn't be no cock either. Of course. Last year you believed that flying saucer was over East Rutherford. So that could really go either way with him. It's important to note here that Machiavelli also said it's not necessary for a prince to have all the positive qualities, but they must appear as though they do, and this is where Polly may run into some problems. According to Machiavelli, a prince must be like a lion and a fox. That is to say, both strong and cunning. While Polly may not be enough of a chess player to be the fox, like Carmine Sr., he does have the makings of a varsity lion, which is why he would have made an excellent number two, or governor, and may have been underutilized in that capacity. Polly would have provided the stern governor that would act as somewhat of a lightning rod to keep the heat off of Tony from within the family. He is much easier to blame and hold a grudge against than someone like Syl. As a result, grudges going up the ladder are likely to pass by the more likable Syl and onto Tony, whereas if Polly were in that position, it's easier to see the blame getting pinned on him and just staying there. Machiavelli also says that a good number two will tie their fortune to the prince's and always put the prince's interests first. Polly seems to be completely un-Machiavellian in this regard due to his dealings with Johnny Sack. However, in this situation, he acts exactly how Machiavelli says people will. According to the prince, if you don't treat people well, especially those who are responsible for your power, you will lose them, and Polly felt disrespected. They will flock to what they view as a protector of the weak, which we see him do with Johnny Sack, so in that sense, his actions were due to bad treatment and his response fell right in line. Ultimately, I think you can say that Polly generally put Tony interests first, as shown at the end when he takes over the Cifaretto crew, despite his superstitions. Lastly, in terms of being a number two, a prince only takes advice from a select few, even then only when asked, and Polly was an excellent enforcer of that concept. Better yet, 
Go to the ear, nose, and throat department. Get your hearing checked. But in terms of embracing that concept for himself, not so much, and that is where he may start running into trouble as a boss. He takes questionable advice too seriously. But that's what this is, you know. Satanic black magic. Sick shit. Setting aside whether or not advice from questionable sources would affect his actions as boss for now, it also makes him look bad to his people. Oh! I'm just telling you how you're being fucking perceived. Just worry about how you're fucking perceived. And this brings us back to his Sun Tzu quote. It's like Sun Tzu says, a good commander is benevolent and unconcerned with fame. Machiavelli states that in all actions, a prince should seek the reputation of a great man and takes that concept even further by asserting that acts of benevolence, or liberality as he would put it, are not only useless but detrimental unless they bring reputation. While going overboard with benevolence is unlikely to be a problem for Pauli, reputation in general is very important to a prince. According to Machiavelli, areas with long-standing aristocracies, similar to the mob, are easier to conquer but harder to hold, and this may be particularly true for Polly for a couple of reasons. First, a prince who is highly esteemed is harder to conspire against. In Polly's case, this may be easy because not only is Polly less likely to figure out the plot than some bosses, but once the act was done, they would have little to fear in the way of retribution, as opposed to somebody like Tony, who would have people like Christopher and possibly Syl to take it personally. The other reason Machiavelli states that they are easier to conquer, which would be especially applicable to Polly, is that it only takes one upset baron to get in. We have already seen when Polly was the upset baron how easy it was for Johnny Sack to start getting info on New Jersey. And with Polly's already abrasive personality, he's likely to have upset barons coming at him from every direction. He jumped out the tree and come at me with a chainsaw. But Polly's personality in general isn't the only problem. The way he's liable to act as boss, either due to his personality or penchant for bad advice, is bound to make things worse. Machiavelli states that when taking areas with long-standing ruling families, one of the most important things is to not rock the boat, so to speak. And this is very unlikely as Pauli is known not only for intensifying existing problems, but also creating problems where there were none before, and that's something the others recognize. Never would have happened if Pauli hadn't initially overreacted, but it's one for the books. <laughs> What do you mean overreacting? Another aspect in which Polly may have trouble, although it would probably depend a lot on who had his ear, is an extension of not rocking the boat, and that is to leave the taxes the same. While Polly is certainly greedy, he isn't to the extent of some of the other characters. So in this particular instance, I actually think his natural inclination would be to leave them the same, but he would easily be persuaded otherwise if a more rapacious person had his ear. There are a few other situations, however, that I think Polly would have been way off the Machiavellian path no matter who had his ear, and the first is to leave matters of reproach in the hands of management. While he would be excellent in that capacity as management, as a boss, he seems to take things very personally. I can't believe I stuck up for him. I feel like I've been stabbed in the heart. And it's unlikely that Polly would be able to stay out. Following along that same line, Machiavelli also says that war is not to be avoided, only postponed to your benefit, and Pauli's fiery personality makes that unlikely. To make things worse, despite what he says, And I need that money for my long-range planning. Pauli really doesn't have a mind for the big picture or the long term. Well, your fucking book against millions going to roll in off the Esplanade. I figured you'd take it, side. This, interestingly enough, may be a large part of the reason he made it through to the end of the series, but that's a subject for a different episode. Lastly, Machiavelli says that he who neglects what is done for what ought to be done sooner affects his ruin than his preservation, and this is best evaluated through Polly's actions regarding the Ginny Sack joke. In this instance, he disregarded what is done for what ought not be done. Not only are you not supposed to tell on your friends per the status quo, it's not even something you should do aside from that, especially when you yourself make Ginny Sack jokes. In this instance, along with many others, we see that it is unlikely that Polly will consider either what is done or what ought to be done when he is agitated. He would likely only consider what he wanted in the moment, and that would spell disaster according to Machiavelli. Ultimately, despite appearing to be at first glance, Polly is not a very Machiavellian character outside of his aptitude for being a governor. He lacks the subtlety required to be a fox, and while his straightforward nature does have its advantages, in the end it would prove to be more of a hindrance than a help. Well, thanks for watching this Machiavellian Monday here on Soprano Street, soon to be Bully Whispers. 
As always, like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you at the next score. I was born, grew up, spent a few years in the army, a few more in the camp, and here I am. I have a wise guy.